All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Wednesday Night Lab. My name is Dylan Brewer, and I'm a student hourly worker here um, for the Biotech Center. On behalf of the Biotechnology Center, UW-Madison Division of Extension, Wisconsin Public Television, Wisconsin Alumni Association, and UW-Madison um, Science Alliance, welcome to Wednesday Night the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. It is my pleasure tonight to introduce you to Eric Stewart. Tonight, Eric Stewart will be talking on how his research uses geologic mapping to predict um, groundwater contamination. Before we get started, we're gonna ask um, Dr. Stewart a couple of questions. Um, five questions. Five questions. If you're here, you know the drill. Um, um, Eric, where were you born? I was born in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Okay. And where did you attend high school? I attended high school in Circle Pines, Minnesota. Okay, awesome. And where did you go to for your undergrad? Uh, University of Minnesota. Awesome. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what did you study while you were there? Uh, geology and geophysics. Okay, awesome. And um, when you went on to get advanced degrees, where did you get those? I did my master's at uh, Idaho State in Pocatello and then my PhD in, at uh, Texas a &M. Awesome. All right, everyone, please join me in welcoming Eric Stewart. All right, well, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to talk here. I really appreciate it. Um, before I start, I, I just wanted to acknowledge too my uh, the Fitzpatrick, a co uh, a colleague at the survey. A lot of the work I'll talk about today is, is his work. So I um, just want to make sure that he gets his credit. Um, there we go. All right, before I start, I wanted to just talk about the purpose of the whole project and what we're trying to do. Um, so as, as many of you know, probably dissolved arsenic is, dissolved arsenic in groundwater is a, a major problem in Wisconsin, in Eastern Wisconsin in particular. And um, arsenic is a carcinogen. So um, it can lead to various kinds of cancers. So you don't want it in your water. Um, so something like uh, half of the reported, of the wells reported in the uh, Wisconsin DNR in their online uh, 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 groundwater database contain uh, detectable levels of arsenic. And if you go to higher levels, so for like the Western parts of those counties, you're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 20% of wells exceeding the EPA limit, which is um, for reference 10 micrograms per liter. And then um, even higher levels, you go to like five times the EPA limit, you're sitting at around three and a half percent countywide of, of groundwater wells. So it's an issue. Um, and this is for Fond du Lac and Dodge counties, which are the focus of this, of this work. And these are the counties right here, down in kind of the Southeast part of the state. Okay, so when we plotted the groundwater results, we noticed these spatial patterns. Um, and that's what's depicted on the map on the, uh, on the right. So the, this is from Northwestern Dodge County and the blue dots uh, are groundwater wells that contain less than two micrograms per liter dissolved arsenic. The tan are, these ones here are two to 10 and the red are greater than 10. And so again, the EPA limit is 10 micrograms per liter. And so what we found is that there are these patterns. So there's a, a lot of tans and reds basically in the, on the bottom and a lot of blues on the top. And so the goal of this project was, can we use geologic mapping to try to understand these patterns? What's, what's causing all those higher valleys in the south, but not in the north? So that's where I'm gonna go with this. Okay. Um, before I get to arsenic though, I'm gonna start by talking about the rocks of Wisconsin. So their age um, and also their context. So uh, where they fit in, in the geologic timeline and then how we map them because that's the basis for um, groundwater studies basically. And then I'll get into the, the three main um, variables I would say that, that are controlling arsenic. Um, the first is folds and faults. So, you might think that rocks are like 
static and they don't deform, they don't move. But they can actually be pretty intensely folded. So if stresses are high, if pressures are high, if temperatures are high, you can get them to fold, you can get them to fault. So um, they can smear, they can break and fail. They can do all sorts of stuff. Now the rocks in Wisconsin I'll talk about aren't this spectacularly folded. Um, they're pretty flat line, but they are deformed a little bit. And, and as I'll talk about, we think that's enough to actually make a difference. Um, and then the other two, um, stratigraphy. So the, the geologic unit that the wells are drawing water from and, and also how the well is constructed. And we think all those are important. And I'll talk about this project to model this and to look at um, approaches to, to potentially mitigate um, these, uh, the, the higher values. Okay, so here um, we're looking at, on the left is the geologic time scale. And what I've done is I've highlighted the, the geologic periods that the rocks in Dodge and Vonalek counties um, are primarily, uh, that, they, uh, that they're present in. Okay, so Dodge and Vonalek counties in the state of Wisconsin are down here in the, kind of in the southeast part. And the, uh, the ages are Cambrian through Silurian. Um, in terms of millions of years, it's something like, 500 some million years to about 400 to, um, 410 million years or something like that. Um, geologists will also take the, um, the age and then we'll give them, we'll give the rocks names. So in the middle, this is a, a stratigraphic column for the um, rocks in, in, uh, in, uh, in Southern Wisconsin basically. And the units that are going to be particularly important are the uh, are um, okay. I'm going to take that off. The rocks that are particularly important are um, in this red box here, and so it's the Cinnabi group, and and this is a carbonate unit, and the uh, underlying uh, unit is the St. Peter Formation, and so this is a sandstone unit, and um, the contact between these two is going to be particularly important. So it's called the sulfide cement horizon. And this isn't a formation or anything like that, but it's an interval that um, contains high concentrations of arsenic. And as I'll talk about, um, this is going to turn out to be pretty important um, as we go forward. Okay, so I wanted to set the stage a little bit too in terms of the context. So the geologic ages are Cambrian through Silurian for the rocks um, in Southern Wisconsin. And um, in terms of context, this is actually pretty old for, um, the, for, um, for, for rocks that record um, complex life. So all the older rocks were called Precambrian. And then at the beginning of the Cambrian here about 540 million years ago, there was this explosion of hard-bodied multicellular life. So when you think of like trilobites and things like that, um, they were running around in the, in the Cambrian period. Um, but again, the rocks in Wisconsin, these are pretty old. So the world at that time would have been a lot different. Um, so for example, by the time you get to um, the late Silurian into the Devonian, so this is now 400 to um, 300 and maybe 60 million years ago, that's when you start to get land plants evolving. Um, true, true forests don't start until the late Devonian. So when most of the rocks in Wisconsin were being deposited, uh, there would not have been much on the land. It was sort of the sands, soils, things like that. Uh, so things get kind of bizarre. So as, as time goes on, you start getting um, more and more complex life, things evolve. Um, there's a period in the, in the Pennsylvania, so well after the rocks in Wisconsin were were formed around say 300 million years ago when oxygen levels in the atmosphere were really high mm -hmm. and it spawned these giant insects. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, this is Arthropleurus, um, a giant millipede, which uh, 
I think it's the sort of thing that you have nightmares about. <laughs> um, and there's also giant dragonflies, things like that. Um, luckily, our oxygen levels have decreased since then, so uh, insects are not able to grow that large anymore. So. <laughs> Except in our, our uh, those B-grade Hollywood um, horror movies, which everybody likes. Um, as time goes on, though, um, again, life continues to get more complex. So by the Permian, you start getting lizards. This is uh, 275 million years ago or so. Turtles in the Triassic, dinosaurs start in the Triassic. Crocodiles in the Jurassic, this is the age of Stegosaurus. So now we're 100 and about 40, 144 million years ago to maybe 200 million years ago. Uh, and then snakes, snakes in the Cretaceous, that's the time of T-Rex, um, Triceratops, things like that, as you go forward in time. And then humans, um, maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 to 300,000 years for, for modern humans to evolve. So the rocks in Wisconsin are really, really old compared to, compared to us, um, and even compared to life in general. All right, so we take that, we have our, we have our geologic timeline, and we have our, our stratigraphic column, and we map these rocks because that's the first steps towards understanding groundwater problems. Um, so we'll go outside, we'll go out in the field, and we'll identify sandstones, we'll identify dolostones, we'll identify shales, and, and then we'll give them names based on that stratigraphic column. And then we'll create uh, something that looks like what's on the left there, a map, basically. And if we zoom in on what the maps look like, so all of these colors on the map on the right are different geologic units um, reflected in that stratigraphic column. And the maps, it's not just, we're just not just mapping in 2D, there's actually a three-dimensional component to this. So we can extract the elevations of our contacts, um, which you can see here, um, this is a vertically exaggerated um, map from the Driftless area, it's not really this steep, but we can extract those elevations and we can combine that with uh, well data. So anytime a well is drilled, the well driller will, will record a log and this gets sent to the state. And as part of that, there are, there's a, the, the well driller will record things like sand rock, lime rock. And we can take those lithologic picks and we can um, assign formation names to them. And the reason we do this is because we want to create 3D surfaces. So we take our map contacts and we take our logs and we create these 3D surfaces. So this is a, a 3D surface of, of one of our important units, the Sinope Group. And this is Fond du Lac County here. This is Dodge County. This is Jefferson County. So this is Eastern Wisconsin. And in, in this map, the warm colors are higher elevation. Uh, the cooler colors are lower elevation. This is really useful for us because we wanna know where the rocks are folded and where they're faulted. And we need this surface to do that. So all these little ripples, these little undulations in the map, that's what we're looking at because those things might be important for concentrating the minerals that um, can contain arsenic. This is another um, 2D view of a similar sort of thing. This is now from southern, southwestern Wisconsin. But this is again that uh, a surface of the base of our Sinope group and our strata of a column that's right here. This is an Ordovician unit and the warm colors are higher elevation cooler colors at lower elevation. And here you can see that there are these, these abrupt, sort of abrupt changes, I guess, in the elevation of this, of, this, of this unit. And that's our fold. And those are the sorts of things that we're gonna key in on. In this case, we think it might be cut by faults as well. Okay, so now I'm gonna to start to transition into some of the, um, variables that might be able to impact whether or not a groundwater well is going to detect arsenic. But first, I thought I'd just um, briefly talk about um, the minerals that tend to contain the arsenic. So we want to understand areas that might concentrate these arsenic bearing minerals. In Wisconsin, there's a couple of types of minerals that tend to contain arsenic. Um, I should say that in the, in the Paleozoic rocks in Wisconsin. So one are these sulfide minerals, iron sulfide minerals. So pyrite and marcosite, 
Um, pyrite is, is, is fool's gold, is what maybe a lot of you know it as. And uh, marcasite is, has the same formula, but has a different crystal structure. And in, in, in core, very often these iron sulfides look like this. It's the black material in the core here. And, and it's black because it's very, very fine grained. If it grew to larger sizes, it would look gold. So iron sulfides contain it. So we wanna know places that are gonna concentrate iron sulfides. That's one thing we look for. And the other is iron hydroxides. So uh, in particular, if you have a sulfide and you expose it to oxygen, it oxidizes and it turns into something that looks like this. So this used to be a sulfide concretion. Now it's an, now it's an iron hydroxide. This can also contain um, um, arsenic in it as well. So we're looking for places that might have a lot of iron hydroxides. All right. So where I'm gonna go with this is that these folds and faults have the potential to concentrate things like sulfides. And in, as I go forward in this talk, I'm gonna focus more on the sulfides and the iron hydroxides, but the iron hydroxides are really important. And if anybody has any questions about that, um, feel free to ask. Um, but we, we have actually thought about that too quite a bit. All right. So the physical characteristics of these structures, these folds and faults are gonna be important. So one of the things we noticed um, in a number of places is that um, these, these folds are riddled with big vertical fractures. So you can see that in this quarry face here that run all the length of the, of the wall. We see the same thing in core. So these are cores, for, um, pictures of two cores. So now we've moved over to, um, this is Dodge County. And on the map on the right, the stars are the locations um, of these drill cores. And the black lines on this are locations of folds and faults that have been mapped because we made those 3D surfaces, right? Um, so just visually, I mean, this is, this is one example, but so you get big vertical fractures in the core when you're close to the map structure and it's pretty clean, not many folds or fault or not many fractures rather uh, when you're farther away. And we we do logs of this. So, so the logs is a, the X axis on this log is vertical fractures per foot. And so it just says you go all the way down the core from zero to uh, about 500 feet, you tend to get more fractures in these cores that are near the, near the, near the folds. Uh, the folds, the folds and faults are also, also have some other interesting features too that are different than, than rock away from them. There's these things called deformation bands. If you're outside in Southwest Wisconsin, you might see these in places. The deformation bands are these, um, kind of these elevated um, lighter colored zones in the sandstone here. And they're places where the stresses were enough to crush the rock, crush the sand grains together. Um, and because of that, it's better cemented and that's why it sticks out an outcrop a little bit. These are places that are gonna occur where the stresses were high, and where you tend to have folds and falls. Uh, the, on the top right here, this is a, this is an SEM, this is an SEM image of, uh, 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 actually it's a BSC image taken on SEM of our deformation band, which is on the top left in the sandstone matrix on the, on the bottom right. So the band, um, so in, in this image, the quartz grains are, are, are gray and the porosity is black. So porosity is open space in the rock. And so the point is when you're in the band, it's all crushed together. When you're outside of it, there's a lot of pore space. And the reason I bring this up is that um, we're interested in places where um, the fluids that are going to be responsible for our sulfides get focused. And so if you have zones where the rocks have been compacted and there's no porosity, groundwater or fluids responsible for sulfides aren't going to want to go through them. So we're looking for places where you can focus those, those fluids through. And this maybe is going to be um, play a part in that. All right, and then finally, we, we have these visual observations of where the sulfides and how they're actually occurring in the core. So when you go to places near the mat folds and faults, you get them in these vertical arrays and these fracture-like features. Again, suggesting that the flow is running vertically, the flow of the fluids responsible for the sulfides are running vertically. Versus farther away, you get diffuse sulfide. Again, the sulfide's the, the black material here. And it's this diffuse zone 
in the core running along stratigraphic horizons. So it's occurring in different settings in the two places. We also looked at volume percent sulfide. So this again is a stratigraphic column. Our St. Peter sandstone, one of our important units is up at the top. And on it is, is a log of volume percent sulfide going from zero to 40. And what we found is that when you're near these structures, you get pretty consistent constant or pretty consistent volume percent sulfide um, throughout most of the core and it spikes in places down at the base. Uh, but there's pretty consistent amount of sulfide and compared to places farther away, there's actually more sulfide present here. Uh, here's some images of what, what the sulfide actually looks like at the microscopic scale. Um, it's pretty interesting. So the image on the left is, is another one of these BSE images taken on SEM. The quartz grains are, these, are the dark grays and the sulfide is the light gray. And so it's forming these really complex um, textures that sometimes cut through the quartz grains um, and uh, sometimes form cements around them. Sometimes you can get it as, as, as in these, what are called cataclastic zones or cataclastic bands where the rocks are actually being crushed and, sh and smeared out and grain sizes are being crushed and reduced. Um, and the image on the right, all the sulfide is the, the, the kind of off-white color and the quartz is the dark gray. Sometimes you get it as beautiful crystals forming um, in open space. So these are, are uh, big blades of, of the mineral marcasite. Um, again, an iron sulfide. Okay, so remember this slide from the beginning. I show this at the beginning. Um, it's from uh, part of the northwestern part of Dodge County. Um, we looked at this, and the blues in this slide were wells that contained um, less than two micrograms per liter of dissolved arsenic. The tans were two to ten. The reds were greater than ten. EPA limit was ten. We said, all right, there's a lot of them in the south. Um, not much arsenic in the north. Are those irregularities drum wounds? They are, you're right, yes. Uh, I wonder if I can go back. Yes, that's exactly right. So yeah, so these features are, the. so the, the question was, are, the, are these features drum wounds? And that is exactly what they are. So those are glacial features. And this is, this is uh, the town of Beaver Dam is right in here for reference. So kind of, I think it runs down in here too. So yes, those are drum wounds. Um, all right, so now what I've done, now, now the, the map to look at is here on the bottom left. And so again, the same groundwater data is on here. So the reds and the yellows are, are, are higher arsenic concentrations, the blues are the low. The contours on this map are, are elevations, are lines of equal elevation of the base of the Sinope group, one of our important order vision units. And the, orient, and the location of our map fold is this red line right here. And that's the thing to pay attention to. So it runs like this. And it basically bisects the zone where you get all those higher arsenic values. We also looked at higher values um, in, in groundwater data, data across the two counties. So these are examples in the map in the middle now. We're looking at wells that record more than 100 micrograms per liter arsenic. So this is 10 times the EPA limit. So much higher values. And the black lines on this map are map folds and faults. And so we, we felt like, well, this seems like there's a pretty good correlation. They tend to occur where you get these, where the black lines are basically. So that produced this kind of conceptual model we had that all right, you get these broad warpings in, in the, these Paleozoic rocks, and that leads to um, an increased amount of fracturing. This could be driving fluid flow through the fractures. Maybe you get more sulfide in these zones. Um, and if you just have more sulfide in the system, maybe you have a higher probability of drawing um, arsenic in your groundwater well. That was the idea. Um, turns out that it's more complicated than that, um, which is maybe not surprising. All right, so now I'll transition talk about some of the other variables. So the stratigraphy and, and how the well is actually constructed because those are also gonna be really, really important. All right, so I showed the stratigraphic figure at the beginning and it, uh, I said, we're gonna focus on the Sinope group, which is a carbonate unit 
and the St. Peter Formation, which is a sandstone. And the contact between the two is called the sulfide cement horizon. All right, the sulfide cement horizon, as I think I mentioned at the beginning, it's a zone of, of higher concentrations or volume percent sulfide compared to the surrounding areas. So these are, are now stratigraphic columns from five cores taken in Dodge County. So down again in the eastern part of the state, the locations are these blue circles here on the map on the right. And all of them are pretty far away from map folds um, with maybe one exception, this one's a little bit close. But we see in the logs, so now, so now in addition to the, the thread of a column, we also have these logs of volume percent sulfide. And the contact where the sulfide cement horizon runs, it's all normalized. So it runs right about in here. So the St. Peter sandstone is the blue, the, the Sunapi group is the tan. And if you look at the logs, there tends to be a spike right about where this blue line is, which represents more or less the sulfide cement horizon. Okay, so you get these big spikes and sometimes they're narrow, sometimes they're more diffuse, but they're pretty consistent. Uh, so this is, this is work that Billy Fitzpatrick did. Uh, we also looked at, so just because you have sulfide doesn't mean there's arsenic in it, right? Um, turns out that the concentration of arsenic within sulfide minerals varies quite a bit depending on where you're at in the stratigraphic section. All right, so here we're looking at, on the, on the y-axis, we're looking at the distance relative to our contact between those two units. So the sulfide cement horizon runs at a value of zero, which is right about here. On the, on the x-axis, we're looking at the, um, the atomic percent arsenic. So the percentage of arsenic um, atoms in the crystal lattice, basically. And it's a, so it's a trace element, it's a minor component because it's mostly iron sulfide. So that's why the values are so low. But, when, but what, what Billy knows is that, well, there's this huge spike. So if you go down low in the section, there's almost none. And this is a little bit deceptive. There's actually, they actually analyzed 15 or 20 grains for each of these samples, but they're all stacked on top of each other because they all recorded basically non-detects. So you get this big spike um, right at that contact. So not only do you have an increase in the, the volume percent sulfide at that contact, but you also um, have a spike in the amount of arsenic in the sulfide. So bad news on both, both fronts, really. Um, and if you go higher up into the carbonates of the sinope group, you also have quite high values up there as well. Oh, and here's our stratigraphic section again. So the, this zone where the spike is occurring is right about in here, the sulfide cement horizon. All right, so we, we did a little bit of testing too. We did some whole rock data. So the graphs I was showing you before are individual mineral grains. And we also looked at um, bulk composition, just taking a hunk of the rock and analyzing it. So here we're getting a lot of um, quartz grains in there as well, because they're sandstones. So these are samples from down low um, in, where the, the individual mineral grains had very, very low concentrations of arsenic. And when we look at the whole rock data, um, uh, so for example, here, the, the, uh, one of the samples ran 57% silica. So that's our quartz component. About 17 or 18% sulfur and iron. That's our, our iron sulfide component. And less than five parts per million arsenic. So this is actually very, very low. So it corroborated the, um, the mineral chemistry data. So down here, even though there's tons of sulfide, there's almost no arsenic in it. So this stuff breaks down in your well you might get a lot of iron in, in your water, but you're not going to get arsenic. We're not going to get much arsenic. All right, we can also look at, again, going back to that well data. Let's see what the wells are saying. So when we first plotted the data, this is for, this is Dodge County down here and Fond du Lac County's up here. Um, here we're plotting, um, uh, we use a, a cutoff of five micrograms per liter. So this is half the EPA limit. So all the red dots are places where you're getting at least five. The blue dots are less than five. And one of the things we noticed is that there was this geographic divide. So there's a lot more red dots in the West, a lot far fewer, uh, fewer red dots in the East. So the issue, the arsenic problem in these two counties is in the Western part, not in the East. And then with it, and there's actually geology reasons for this, I think, um, that, that um, maybe we can get into if there's questions about that. 
Um, but so the 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 well construction report that those drillers provide that gives us an idea of the depth that the well is drawing water from. And because we're mapping these surfaces in three dimensions, we can back calculate and figure out what unit the well is actually drawing water from. And so we can look at this and, and, and start to do um, averages for, for all these different wells um, in terms of the geologic unit it's drawing water from. Okay, so countywide, if a well is drawing water from stratigraphically high units like the Silurian rocks and some shales at the top, um, only about 7% of the wells exceed five micrograms per liter, pretty low. But if you go to, to our problem units, our Sinope group in the St. Peter formation it spikes a lot higher, right? 29, 30% or so. So again, those are the problem intervals. And you go down deeper below the St. Peter formation strat stratigraphic section, um, it drops again. So the problem where the arsenic is occurring is in these, it's primarily gonna be in these two units. Again, that fits with the mineral chemistry data that I was just showing too. And it's the same story at higher if you use a, a cutoff of 10 micrograms per liter, it's really showing the same thing, just a little bit fewer percentages are, are um, exceeding that. All right, so talked about structures that they might be important. Talked about stratigraphy, where in the section you're drawing water from is important. Well, there's another thing that could be important too. How you build your well is gonna be really important. So when a groundwater well is constructed in a, in a home, um, there's, a, the, there's a borehole and the top of the borehole has a, has, a, has a pipe that goes down and it supports the well so it doesn't collapse. Um, it's called the well casing and it's, it's gonna be a solid pipe, steel or, or plastic, and it prevents water from going in. So um, so underneath the cased zone is called the screen zone. So this is an example of a well screen on the left. And again, it's gonna be a pipe that has these little um, openings in them and that allows the water to go in. So in the, in the image on the right here, this well is cased down to right here and then it's screened below it. And the water level um, in the rock is going to run right here. So it's cased down below the level of the, of the, of the water, the saturated zone in the aquifer here. Turns out that some wells are constructed different than that. So some wells, the casing ends above the level of water in the well. So here's a diagram that depicts this. The upper red line is the, is the base of the casing, that solid pipe. The water level in the well is below it down here, the second red line. So the interval between those two is, part, is, is in the screen portion of the well, which has those little holes. So now you have air in that borehole that's in direct contact with rock. And this is rock that's um, 400 to maybe 550 million, 400 to say 500 million years old, right? And that rock hasn't been exposed to air in hundreds of millions of years either. It's been, it's been sitting down there. All right, so what happens when you have sulfides and you expose them to air? So here's, here's from that same core. And these images were taken um, right after this rock was removed from the ground. A few years later, this is what the core looks like, right? It's oxidizing. So if your sulfides contain arsenic in them, all that stuff can go into your water. If, it's open to the air in the borehole, right? So this has been done. This is, there's a, a lot of really interesting studies were done um, even about 20 years ago that, that, were, that analyzed this and looked at this. Um, the plot on the right is looking at arsenic concentration on the y-axis and it's plotting it relative to the difference between the sulfide cement horizon, that zone in the stratigraphic column that we keep talking about and the water level in the well. And for all these wells, um, the casing is ending above the water level in the, in the well, right? The static water level. And so the zero value is on this, on, on this plot on the x-axis is where the sulfate cement horizon is at 
near the is, is at or nearly at the water level. And that's where you get this huge spike in concentration. So that's what you don't want near well. And, and, and this is a study that was done just to the north of Fond du Lac County and Winnebago and out of game counties. And this led to special casing restriction or casing um, 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 regulations in those counties so that um, this wouldn't happen. So that instead they were requiring casing to extend down through the static water level and go all the way down through the St. Peter into the underlying units um, to prevent exactly what, what, what this diagram is depicting here on the left. Okay, so three things, it's pretty complicated, right? All sorts of different variables seem to impact whether or not a well is, um, contains arsenic. So we needed some sort of a test um, to determine which ones are most important and what, what was their relative importance. And uh, so I, I knew I wanted something something like what epidemiologists use or, or medical doctors. So when, so say, uh, say a person smokes cigarettes, um, it could impact the probability of them developing something like lung cancer. Doesn't mean that the person is gonna develop lung cancer, but it might impact the probability. Um, but there's other factors too. There's maybe how many cigarettes a, post, or a person smokes a day. Um, how long have they smoked for? When did they start? What age? And then there's other factors too, like maybe um, how much exercise does a person get? There's all sorts of factors that can go in to determine whether or not an outcome actually happens. In this case, the outcome will be cancer. The outcome that we want to figure out is whether or not a well is gonna contain arsenic. And our potential variables are things like um, distance to the nearest fold axis, what unit the well is drawing water from, things like that. So the tool that a lot of epidemiologists use is called binary logistic regression. And so again, basically it tests the importance of um, all sorts of different variables and determines whether or not it changes the probability of an event occurring. So to do this, we have to set cutoffs for our event. And the cutoffs I used were concentrations of arsenic and whether or not they exceeded two, five and 10 micrograms per liter. So 10 again being the EPA limit, two reflecting basically detectable levels in the well. And so we tested all sorts of things. And I sort of, um, I haven't been uh, sneaky about what is important. I, the three things that I talked about are the three things that were statistically significant. So I wouldn't have talked about them, I guess, if, I, uh, if, <laughs> if they weren't. Uh, so there's a little bit of math involved to do this, uh, but I avoided the math. And instead I put this incredibly complicated table up. Uh, but, the things to pay attention to are the text on the left. That's actually all that's really important. So what variables are important? Distance to the nearest fold or fault or those map structures we're doing that we define based on our 3D maps. Um, all three cutoffs, they were important. The St. Peter sandstone is problematic. It turned out it's actually the St. Peter that's a bigger issue rather than the overlying centipede. That's what we would find, um, at least in terms of statistical significance. So you don't want your well in the St. Peter if you're gonna avoid it. And, um, and then the well construction characteristics too. So um, particularly at the high values, um, above 10 micrograms per liter, the EPA limit, it's avoiding, um, it's making sure you case well below that static water level is important. Okay, so we can define statistically significant variables um, that's useful, but eventually I realized that we could actually take this a step further. We could, um, we could model risk and model mitigation strategies as well, because what the logistic regression does is it provides um, like a, a best fit, provides best fit coefficients. And in the, in the equation down here on the left, it's these B0, B1, B2. Um, if you have if you know the distance for any well that hasn't been tested, and you know the distance to the nearest fold, you know um, how it was constructed, say from the well construction report, and you know what unit it's drawing water from, which we know because we've mapped the surfaces, you can calculate a probability of our event occurring, our event of detecting arsenic. It turns out for the Western parts of these two counties, um, which is the area we did the, the modeling in, 
we know those variables for about 3,200 wells. And that's again on from these well construction reports that are filed. And here's our surfaces. So this is what we use to um, determine what unit the, 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 the well is drawing water from. And it's just basically a lot of wrangling in Microsoft Excel. So you do a little bit in ArcGIS and do all sorts of simple subtractions and things in, in Excel. All right, so what we can do then, now we have probabilities for massive numbers of, of wells, a lot of them untested. And we can plot this um, and model risk. So what this is a map of is the, uh, this is a map of probability of a well exceeding the EPA limit as is right now for these two counties, Fond du Lac and Dodge County, where there's no regulations in place. Um, it's color coded, so high probabilities are, are in the, the darker colors, the dark reds, and the low probabilities are the, are the yellows, the lighter colors. And so there's zones, depending on how the well is constructed, um, depending on its location. Some areas are, are warmer than others, basically. Um, well, you can't see that. So the probability, um, so down here, it'll say 20%, right down here, it says 20%, but we can't see it on the screen here. And um, so th these are the bulk average, if you take the average of all of these, the probability of ex exceeding the EPA limit in the Western part of these counties is about 20%. Um, and of course it rises as you go to lower values. But we can also do one other thing with the data. So this is the, the current state, but we can actually take it and say, well, let's impose casing requirements like on the counties to the north. Let's say that no well is open to the St. Peter now. And let's say that we're gonna case 50 feet below the static water level in every single well. And we can do that because if we go back, we have these equations and we have these variables for, for all our wells, for our 3,200 wells, we can just manually change it. If, 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 if right now we have a, if right now we're, um, it's open to the St. Peter, we can just close that off and change it and see what it does to the probabilities. And this is what it does, it changes the colors a lot, right? Um, we go from a lot of dark reds to a lot of lighter colors, which is good. So this is a, a situation where all the wells are gonna be cased below the St. Peter and you have at least 50 feet of casing below the static water level. The bulk average drops to 7% right here, if we could see that. Um, and we can do it even a little bit more. We can introduce say 100 feet of casing. And that's what the third one shows. And it drops it even more. So this number is gonna be 4% down here. Um, casing is, uh, so I think the take home point here is that if you were to introduce some of these regulations, you could, um, you could reduce the probability of these, these wells detecting arsenic. You can't eliminate it maybe, um, but casing is expensive too. So this, this is, um, a lot of people would not wanna do this too, right? And there's, and, and um, so there's pros and cons, right? There's a financial cost and, and this is what the model, this is what we predict anyway, would happen if you introduce these sorts of regulations. So um, for my part, um, I actually am glad that I'm not in, I don't have to make these calls. We just provide the information. And that's actually what we do with the surveys. We try to provide unbiased science, basically. Like this is what we, this is what our result is. And um, yeah. All right, so uh, basically this is what we did. We, we, um, we determined three units or three variables were gonna be really important. So our proximity to the folds, our stratigraphic units and, um, and how the well is constructed. This is all gonna impact whether or not a, a well is gonna detect arsenic. And if you're gonna drill a well, it's best to case it deep and to not draw water from the St. Peter sandstone, get the water from below. And the casing regulations can reduce, but not eliminate arsenic risk. Um, and so casing regulations would be one option. 
There's also, you know, filtration systems are another option if you want to reduce the arsenic in your well. So, right. Um, so the, the just acknowledge you. In addition to Billy, there's a lot of other people that contributed at the survey, and the study itself was funded um, by the University of Wisconsin Water Resources Institute. So I really appreciate their support for that. Okay, that's all I got. I have a question. I, I'm not a chemist, so I don't know why, where arsenic comes in, what that has to do with sulfide. Is there, is that just happens to be this particular geological formation, or I mean, why does it concentrate more in with sulfide? Okay, yeah. So the question was, um, why is the um, why is the arsenic why does the arsenic concentrate in the sulfides and not in and not in other not in other minerals, basically? Yeah, I think I think it's just just has to do with the, the chemistry of the arsenic and, and it, how it fits. It's able to substitute into the lattice of the iron of the iron sulfide easily compared to other minerals. Um, but it's interesting, the, the iron hydroxide, so the other source I didn't talk much about, um, in that case, it doesn't fit in the lattice well, but it, it adsorbs onto the surface really well of these minerals. And then it can be released if the, if the mineral breaks down. So I guess in the case of the sulfides, just say, yeah, it fits in the lattice really well. Um, it, it's able to substitute easily as well. How deep are those wells that we're talking about? 3,200 if, if 50 feet isn't enough and 100 feet isn't enough, how deep are they? Um, yeah, okay. So, yeah, so if, um, so, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so a, a lot of them, so as in, would you need to drill deeper in order to, yeah. I mean, yeah. Like how deep to get to below the St. Peter level? I mean, I grew up in that county and we got a farm and our level was 600 feet deep. Yeah. Water. I mean, is that typical or is that atypical? I mean, what's the depth of the cost? Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a really great question. So the um most of these wells, um, when they hit the the static water level or when they hit the water table basically, um, they're not gonna run usually you can get enough water to pump maybe 50 feet or something. It, it varies depending on the unit and things like that. But, but yeah, so, so when I introduced those numbers, casing 50 feet below the water level, 100 feet below the water level, that would require a lot more drilling probably in many, many cases. Um, the 600 feet you're, you're talking about for a well, that's unusually deep. Most of the vast majority of the wells in these areas um, actually, I, I gotta be careful. It really varies depending on where you're at. Fond du Lac has, has some pretty deep ones. 450, 500 feet walls are pretty common. Dodge County, though, a lot of them 100 feet deep maximum. So. Yeah, you. Can just speak right into that. Uh, is that interesting? You read about you can filter for filters and get arsenic out? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So there's filtration systems. Um, and uh, yeah, yep, yeah. I think reverse osmosis works. Um, at least it, yeah. Um, it depends a little bit on the on the type of arsenic. Um, it can have a couple of different states, but in the in the, in the impact of the filtration system depends on uh, a little bit on the on the state of the arsenic. But um, actually, this is something that some folks at UW Milwaukee are working on. So uh, people are thinking about it anyway. But yes, you, you can reduce the, the amount of arsenic through filtration. I think it'll pick you up on the front row, so I don't think you guys need to Okay. Um, for persons that have lived in this area for years, um, as I understand it, isn't there the possibility that they would build up an immunity to arsenic uh, contained in the water if they've been uh, consuming it all their lives? Uh, my yeah. So I, first of all, I should just preface this by saying that I yeah I'm not I'm not an epidemiologist or anything like that. So I'm probably not. Um, my understanding though is that it's it's more of a cumulative thing. So the more arsenic you consume, the worse it's going to be, and the higher the probability of developing cancer. 
so it wouldn't be an immunity thing. But again, I should just, I'm not, I'm just a geologist, so. <laughs> My question is about the static uh, water level. How stable is that over time? I know groundwater, which I assume is a higher in the geologic column of rock under a given spot, varies a lot. How, how much does that static level vary? It could vary a lot over time, yeah. And so even when you start pumping, um, when an individual well starts pumping, it can drop down. The water level in that well will drop maybe 10, 20 feet, maybe. Um, if you're near a city, you get what are called cones of depressions, and that can change, you know, like by, by quite a lot over time. So yeah, it, it can vary. And so a lot of this is it could be that a well was initially built and um, and it was cased below the, the water level, and now it's no longer if it's an old well. So that's possible. You also have some questions in the chat, if you are able to see those. Sure. OK, so question, if the dole stones are on the top, will the magnesium replace the arsenic and reduce the arsenic to arsenic while the contamination, while the, will the contamination, while the contamination will decrease? Top, will the... I think, um, okay, that's a good question. Um, so the may, so I, th so I think the make, so the, the art, so the, the, so the salt, so if the, I, so if the arsenic is, is in the sulfide, um, I think there's very little magnesium, um, that would substitute into the sulfide lattice. So I, I think the, my understanding is that the dole stones probably would not impact um, or replace the arsenic. Um, hopefully, hopefully that answers that. So I think it wouldn't impact, as I understand it, it wouldn't impact. The presence of the dole stones wouldn't impact. Um, any contamination issues. Uh, hopefully I get it. Um, so uh, Tom Zinn says, can similar mapping help identify risks from other elements such as radon? Um, yeah, yeah um, that's something that we were wondering about. Um, so I, I think um, it would be interesting to do, uh, somebody suggested once machine learning or some, some tool like that, um, where you can draw a whole bunch of variables and look at a whole bunch of, of contamination issues, whether it's radon or cadmium or anything like that. And, and if you're looking at enough variables, maybe you could pick something out. I think, I think yeah. Um, so I think the answer is yeah. Um, I, think, I think mapping could help with that. Um, okay, next question. So where does the arsenic containing water discharged after use in homes? Um, uh, let's see, so here, uh, okay, so I, I guess here, so if, this were a, a house that has a, a private well, and then you use the arsenic or use the water, whether whether in um, in whatever manner. Uh, I think most of it would go into uh, um, um, into a uh, into the into the septic system. So there would be a um, like a holding tank for for solids, I guess, and then a um, and then a, a, a what is it? A little gravel and all sorts. Yeah, the leach field. That's right. Yeah. Um, so it would, uh, so that water would just, it, it would, it would go to the leach field and then it would, um, uh, slowly drop down, um, and return, I guess, into the, into the rock, into the saturated zone. So, and the idea behind the, the leach field, I, I think, is that, um, um, any, uh, the, any, um, uh, 
the, 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 by the time the water reaches the, the saturated zone again, the aquifer, it'll be, it'll be purified basically. So, but in terms of arsenic, arsenic, um, so actually that's a good point. So the arsenic um, might not make it down that far. So arsenic, uh, I think I mentioned it, it's, it, it strongly adsorbs to iron oxides and iron hydroxides. So it's possible that that would actually, as it was descending, it would absorb onto the iron oxides or iron hydroxides um, in the in the superficial material or something like that. I don't know. Lots of city or neighboring two city folks use a well for their water supply, but are on the municipal sewage. Is there any treatment at the sewage treatment plant that would? Remove the arsenic from the effluent water discharge. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, uh, going to another part of the state where groundwater contamination is a problem, I was wondering if you could say something about the areas, uh, I guess, in the Door County Peninsula, also in the southwest part of the state where the issue is contamination. Uh, of areas where the uh, bedrock is karst limestone and the problems caused by contamination of groundwater in those areas. Yeah, yeah. So uh, um, just in case anybody in Zoom couldn't hear, so the yeah. So when you go to karst areas, um, mm -hmm. how are the contamination? Uh, how, how's that different? So there, because of the karsting, um, it's it's stuff coming off the surface. So if you have um, there there. Um, uh, if you have a leaking um, a septic system or something like that, well, because of the cars, it can enter the groundwater system really quickly. Or if you have um, fertilizers in a farm field or something like that. And the issue there is again, drill deep wells in case deep, because you wanna to get to those lower aquifers because that's the water that's not gonna be impacted. So. Or if you have a cable in your area. Yeah, drill, yeah, so get, yeah, yeah drill, drill deeper, yeah. So. Yeah, more general question. Uh, what percentage of uh, the seven and a half minute quadrangles in Wisconsin now have geologic mapping available? Oh, that's a good question. Um, very few, very few. Yeah, most of the mapping is kind of one to one hundred thousand. So the seven and a halfs are one to twenty-four. Um, there's a there's a selection of them in southwest Wisconsin that are done, but um, a very very small percentage of the state is mapped at that scale. So. All right, for all those questions, you can give me one round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>